This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Emory Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. It gives me great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Sharon Hayes. She's Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine and Vice Chair Academic Affairs and Faculty Development at Mayo Clinic. Sorry. <laughs> She's also the founder of the Emory Women's Heart Clinic. The one at Mayo. The one at Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just to tell you a little bit about her, time will not permit me to tell you her great CV, but she maintains an active clinical practice at the Women's Heart Clinic at Rochester, where she serves as Vice Chair of Academic Affairs and Faculty Development. She previously served as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for 10 years through 2020. With her leadership, she has set strategy for DNI activities across Mayo Clinic and has developed solutions for equity in patient care in the workforce. She's a member of numerous national initiatives, and that is how I first got to know her. She's nationally recognized as an educator, a speaker on diversity, women's health, and cardiovascular issues. She received her degree, her medical degree from Northwestern in Chicago, and she pursued fellowships in internal medicine, cardiovascular research, and cardiovascular disease at Mayo Clinic Rochester before joining the staff in 1990. She's a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and a fellow of the American Heart Association, and she's a member of the Association of Black, Black Cardiologists, where she served in many volunteer leadership roles. She's married to David, an electrophysiologist, and she has two adult children. And on a personal note, I will say that no one in the field of cardiology has taught me about diversity, equity, and inclusion than Dr. Hayes. She is truly an ally, a sponsor, and I think that if we want to achieve equity in cardiology, we need allies and sponsors like Dr. Hayes. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I hope I can live up to this and talk a little bit today about not my, necessarily my science research, but I want to reassure you that there is science to this, that often we say we can't, how do you measure inclusion? How do you talk about all of these? And we'll talk a little bit about how we can do that. I'm gonna talk about, um, we're, we're all in, I think everyone wants health equity. I'm gonna talk briefly about that and why it is directly linked to diversity, inclusion, equity and making cardiology, which has some issues in its culture, a bit better and more appealing, which will help our patients. Because some of us don't necessarily want to do this for ourselves or for other um, practitioners. But I think once you know the data about how some of these issues um, that we have some science about uh, need to be improved. So I have no disclosures other than I, I really, this is a, a life's work. If you're looking to be more just, um, uh, equitable, have more diversity and inclusion, it doesn't happen overnight. And it, even within an individual, um, there's lots of work to be doing. And so I would not say I'm necessarily an expert, but I am um, practicing this. So this is from a study, it's an editorial cartoon from many years ago, but it was a study where it was actually primary care physicians that were asked the same indeterminate um, uh, sort of chest pain syndrome and whether or not you would be um, referred to a cardiologist basically. And so it was black and white men and black and white uh, uh, women. And of those groups, black women were the least likely to be taken seriously and referred on. Um, uh, it, as one evidence of uh, this amazing um, paper that Modele put together. Um, but you can see that some of the system solutions include diversity of the healthcare uh, workforce, reframing delivery, and looking at bias and discrimination. We know that, so my area of expertise is heart disease in women, and we know that still 
not just 20, 30 years ago, but women are often misdiagnosed or diagnosed late when having a myocardial infarction. There's multiple reasons. One could argue because they may have different causes of their heart attack, but they also sometimes, particularly with spontaneous coronary artery dissection, <clears throat> they don't look like a heart attack patients. And many are sent out of the ED without a cardiac workup only to come back with their STEMI and occasionally are sent out of the ED with, a with an elevated troponin. And many would argue that that would be unlikely to happen in a man of the same age. And so even when we have protocols, we may not follow those. So some of you may have seen some of the, the memes on the racist soap dispenser. And why am I showing this in this talk? Well, this is TJ and Larry, and it's a funny little YouTube about every time TJ, who's a black man, puts his hand under the soap dispenser, no soap comes out. And every time Larry, the white friend, it does. It is not because it senses motion, it's because these sensors sense pigment. And infrared light is not reflected back. That has direct bearing on the fact that we know that pulse oximeters are not as accurate in black skin or darker skin as they are in white skin. And that really came to light during COVID in that we were sending black people out who were sicker because we thought their, um, their uh, oxygen saturation was higher. So when we talk about health disparities, if you look at the things on the right side uh, of that, many of those are things that are, are systemic, language barriers, poor communication, low socioeconomic. Those are all reasons that some of our patients don't do as well. But it is those things on the left that I think we're gonna focus on today, workforce diversity, bias discrimination, leadership diversity, and, overt, um, uh, and uh, uh, unconscious biases. So we'll start with some cases because we're gonna bring it back to the cardiology workforce. So there's Dr. Uh, Betty Hernandez. She's a second year interventional fellow. She um, is in a nationally ranked program, booming practice, lots of work, eight men, one woman, and there's not a woman interventionalist on the faculty. The male fellows share a uh, locker room with the faculty, but, the, uh, but she goes with the nurses and the techs. Um, case assignments are made first thing in the morning. And so she often finds out about them after she comes out of the locker room from the other guys and, um, and, so, uh, and doesn't have a lot of say in that. A an attending told her that he feels uncomfortable meeting with her in his office and he won't mentor her, but he regularly meets with men there. Um, she asked for feedback from the faculty and she's always told she's doing fine. She knows she's maybe not. She's regularly introduced um, to patients by attendings um, as Betty, not Dr. Hernandez, but the men are introduced as Dr. Jones. Um, patients often question her background, asking where she's from. She's also noticed that nurses sometimes second guess her. They'll go to the other fellows and ask uh, the same question after she has answered it. We have Dr. Jamil Jones. It's his third year on faculty and he's getting increasingly frustrated. He was heavily recruited, bright guy. He was heavily recruited by prestigious institutions. He was offered the moon, research time, competitive compensation, startup funds. And when he was being recruited, they emphasized that his diversity, it was implied or um, stated outright that his minority status was important to the program. He'd be the first black uh, faculty in the department. So he chose the job that was most prestigious, at least to him but he feels like he's struggling. He's fallen behind his other recent hires. They've been assigned or found mentors. He hasn't gotten his research program off the ground. He's been asked to sit on a number of diversity committees and task forces, and he's taken on many um, uh, black residents and students as mentees who seek him out as a successful black man. So he gets tapped for advice about diversity to enhance colleagues' projects and grants, but he's never included as personnel or as a co-author on the resulting grants. Patients have asked to switch doctors to a white man. He's been misidentified by employees and patients as other men of color, including transport, housekeeping staff, even when he's wearing his faculty ID. So he shared his frustration with what was going on with a white colleague um, uh, who told him he was just being too sensitive that even if that happened, no one really meant it, it's a good place. He feels stuck and unhappy. So Dr. Jones and Hernandez are not sure how to become better cardiologists. They're unsupported. They're uncertain if they've chosen um, the right path, either location or cardiology. They are onlys, which we'll talk about. Being an only or a first is a, a special risk. And they're reminded that they're different in multiple ways. They don't get feedback on their performance. So it's really hard to do better or figure out what they're doing wrong. 
They experience overt biases and microaggressions, and they absolutely know that their performance is not what it should be. So cardiology is a team sport. Virtually none of us, I mean, an angiogram cannot be done with just the cardiologist. You can't do a transesophageal echo. We can't do anything. And so looking at that premise and that teams that are diverse, particularly those with gender diversity, that's where the most evidence is, um, have better outcomes, um, better problem solving. This does not mean that it's a smoother group. In fact, when there is diversity in a group, part of the reason people get to better solutions is they call each other out. And that can be uncomfortable, but we would be better, I would posit, if we our cardiology um, workforce was more diverse. And there is some evidence that having more Blacks in particular, that's um, had the, the most data, um, as well as women. So in this study that's several years old, they found that among, they randomized Black men to see either a Black doctor or a white or Asian doctor. And among those black men that saw a black doctor, they were much more likely to agree to preventive screening or treatment. And also the notes written by the black doctors um, revealed far more detail on social determinants of health. Now, we don't know if that was because they focused on that more or actually the patients felt that they could share that more with a black doctor versus a white doctor. This was published last week in uh, JAMA Network Open, which found, again, not cardiology data. They looked at primary care, um, but if there was a higher representation of Black primary care doctors in a county, the outcomes for Black patients was substantially better. I think the other issue is less than half of the counties in, um, in the U.S. had a single Black doctor. So this represents data on less than half of the counties. And, um, and so this also has relevance perhaps for increasing the population. And then women, there've been a number of studies that have shown that women give at least as good and in some cases better outcomes, not a lot for cardiology, it's emergency medicine and primary care. But I share these because it's not that we're gonna change the field, but there's no good reason not to look at this and there may be some advantages. So how are we doing? Well, we're not doing that great for women. When I became a cardiologist, you heard in 1990, um, about 6% of cardiologists were women. Um, that was, you see on the graph 2016, it was 12.6, it's about 15% now. And um, so it's 300% more than when I became a cardiologist, but it's still very low. It's a very male dominated um, and particularly among the interventional. Um, and if we look at underrepresentation by race and ethnicity, similarly, uh, we have about 3% are Black cardiologists and about 4% Hispanic. So when we think, what are the implications for this? Um, again, we're an old profession. Um, over 60% um, uh, of cardiologists are over age 55. And many, um, uh, as we were talking about before the uh, conference, work long after 65 or the standard age age limit. But that is when um, we are older than many of the specialties. Um, we do have, at least talking to other folks at um, academic uh, centers, we're all hiring um, because we need more cardiologists. And cardiology like orthopedics and neurosurgery um, is now sometimes struggling to attract enough diverse talent, particularly women um, uh, because of perceptions, which we're gonna go deeply in. Cardiology has what we've um, called a residency cliff because if 45% of internal medicine residents are women and then it drops down to 20, 25% cardiology, we're not attracting them in the representation. You can dis discern whether that's a problem or not, but we, we aren't as popular uh, a specialty for women as many others. And the pipeline is, remains a trickle for underrepresented in medicine and underrepresented in cardiology. I'll use that acronym, URIC. And so some of this comes down to our culture. Um, certainly uh, th that um, it, we as a group, one, it's a more challenging specialty than many um, in terms of hours, in terms of the demands, the call. Um, but that unrestricted availability, working 60, 80 hours, is really not desirable. Um, if it ever was, it's much less now. The macho image of the cath cowboy probably doesn't serve us well. And many of the concerns, whether it's work flexibility or other things, really um, uh, affect us all. Um, I have, uh, when we're talking about flexibility, and, and we'll, we'll only touch briefly on, but often when we say we want a flexible workforce, 
um, the, the, we immediately go to thinking about reproductive age women. Oh, they're the ones they want to be, you know, be with their children. Uh, but I, I can't imagine there is a single one in in here that would say, I don't want flexibility. We would all want more autonomy and flexibility and sort of reimagining what that means. Um, and we'll talk briefly about that because there's a great policy statement from ACC about why we should think about this more. And then sometimes policies that were put in place a long time ago or social or societal norms or institutional norms that inadvertently um, adversely affect certain groups. Um, and um, so what do future cardiologists think of cardiology? So there was a survey done about 15 years ago and then updated and published last year. And I, I was one of the co-authors in this. And we surveyed internal medicine residents, both those who wanted to go into cardiology were planning to apply to cardiology and those who did not. The perceptions of both groups was that cardiology was not very welcoming. It was stiff, it was hard and didn't look like it wanted to change. And that the um, work-life balance which was important to both men and women almost equally had actually increased over the decade between the two surveys. And so I think those are the kinds of things if we really want to attract the best and brightest is looking how we look to them is gonna be important. And so what, what do folks want? Well, they want equity. They want equity and compensation, promotion, opportunity once they are, um, leadership, flexibility, respect, and safety. But many women um, and underrepresented in uh, minorities in cardiology experience a number of things disproportionately. Any of these things can happen. Well, motherhood bias perhaps doesn't happen to the men in the room, but any of these things can, can happen to um, anybody, but they disproportionately. And some actually derail careers. And I think that's where we have opportunities um, to look at for that only in terms of isolation and exclusion, to have appropriate ways that organizations can deal with harassment, to recognize that there may be a disproportionate amount of office housework or non-promotable work that gets um, delivered or put in the lap of women and minorities and looking at ways to equitably um, distribute those. And recognizing that particularly our younger staff and fellows um, uh, of uh, uh, all of them uh, are more likely to be mistreated by allied health professionals. So if we talk about sexual harassment, been a lot in the literature. Um, I just wanted, the there was a very large multi-specialty uh, survey and it does appear that more women in cardiology compared to women in other specialties have experienced or witnessed sexual harassment. This is a more of an issue in younger versus older and more likely in LGBTQI and plus um, than heterosexual in, in, uh, individuals. And it does lead to a lower engagement satisfaction and likely to stay. And so I think it's not, you know, Me Too isn't over. And I think what we know from data and from the national, um, uh, from NASM report on sexual harassment in specialties or organizations that are very male dominant, often we see higher levels of sexual harassment and that may be reflected in the fact that um, uh, cardiology. And then in terms of other mistreatment, there've been several pretty um, highly cited um, studies that was first done on surgeons and then they looked at internal medicine. So they did um, surveyed over 22,000 um, individuals at the end of their um, uh, qualifying exam and asked them, uh, and remarkably, the response rate was, oh, you know, like 95%. And this is after taking a long test. Uh, but two thirds of women um, experienced um, mistreatment, and this was defined as sexual harassment, gender, racial, parental discrimination, or verbal, emotional, or physical abuse during their training. And we're not gonna talk in detail about things that they might've experienced from uh, faculty, but I think importantly, because sometimes we forget it, and it has increased is the majority was experienced by uh, among women patients and patients families and this is something that we more senior people generally don't experience nearly as much um, and we may be unaware of the resident in the room or the nurse um, that is uh, getting berated or even physically challenged and I think um, there's a whole talk on how we can address that but if there is not a policy currently on um, patient-facing um, at Emory is looking at how that and making sure it's upheld. 
And the scope of patient behavior, I mean, sometimes it's actually physical, asking to, uh, to have another um, uh, caregiver, but often racial and gender slurs uh, that can be very disconcerting. And often um, individuals who are affected do not report them, particularly fellows and junior faculty, because um, they feel that somehow we might blame, well, you must've done something, said something to make that patient angry, or you could have done better with that. And so I think it's one of those hidden abuses that we that's pretty common. It's global. Um, so this was a paper that looked at surveyed cardiologists about their experience. And again, both men and women experience um, emotional harassment, sexual harassment, and discrimination. It tended to be more common among women. And it also was mo more common in North America than it was in other areas. And if we look at, this was just published a, a few weeks ago, but uh, uh, you know, we talk a lot about burnout. So what are the, some of the things that um, might be relevant to this that cause burnout in cardiologists? Lack of respect from, co from colleagues and others, lack of autonomy, lack of flexibility, and too many hours at work. So there's other things we can't get rid of EPIC, but, um, uh, the, but there are some things that we can control in our app. So, Quick, I know most of you are online, but if you look at this uh, image, do you see people or animals? For those in the room, people, animals. Okay, I always see animals first. Like I've looked at this a hundred times. That is how my brain is wired. I can see the people. And for those of you who can't see the other one, because sometimes we're so hardwired, is the white, the, the white space as a dog, a bunny and a cat. The people are, you know, looking at each other, looking at the baby. But this is one of those where um, I, I, to this day, I show this slide all the time and I always see the white space first. We know that when we see people, we see them and we make assumptions based on the, the way our brain has been taught to be wired. So I like to pick on Delta. Here's a hub, We I, I fly out of a hub too. But Delta's had two fairly, um, uh, prominent um, episodes where a black woman physician offered their assistance when a patient was in trouble and there was a call for it and they were told, go sit down, we want a real doctor or something to that effect. And um, it, it is, I share this because I hope Delta will do better, but I also share this because we have to understand that um, many of our colleagues, because they don't look the part, just like our patients who don't look the part of a heart attack, um, may not get some of the same respect. And I, um, as, uh, and apparently in this one, it was a psychiatrist that ended up caring for this ill patient. Nobody wants to work with this guy, right? Um, it, you know, it, it, but he's a brilliant interventionalist and he has great outcomes and he's got two R01s. And so we, we put up with him, but that same demeanor, I'm not saying, but even just pointing or being um, uh, sort of, uh, right, um, is not tolerated as well in women and particularly women of color. And I think recognizing that there is a much narrower range. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm having a very collegial conversation with my colleague, Dr. Amash there and the Mayo photographer caught the, the photo, but, you know, that behavior, you look at that and that looks like you know, maybe maybe she's too aggressive. And I think remembering that these are societal and, and biases and how sometimes we jump to, you know, perhaps that angry black woman when she's not angry at all, but she has to check herself. And this has been called, you know, the tightrope bias, um, but it's when high status jobs and being a cardiologist, high status and perceived and really is masculine. And we know what those qualities to be a great cardiologist are. It's calm and it's commanding and leadership that we don't, it's not associated with being modest or communal. And so women in particular, but also racial minorities, they know this, right? I, I am thinking when I give a presentation to this day, um, I am thinking about, I need to be effective in this role. So if, I, if I'm too strident, then I will turn some people off. They, I won't bring them with me. And if I'm too soft, I won't be viewed as a leader and they won't follow me. Women know this. And so it's a narrower um, uh, area. And you can imagine how thinking that may impair your performance. So this is a challenge and there's actually, and I say it may be dangerous because there actually was a study that was published about um, carrying the code pager and they asked men and women. Um, and so, you know, you, if somebody's, had a cardiac arrest, they call the code team, there's 20 people that 
and that the person holding the code pager has to command and control, right? I'm the I'm running this and start doing that. Women who do, did that were very uncomfortable. They talked about using various coping skills. One of them was, I'm going to, announcing beforehand, I'm going to be yelling some things or going around afterwards and apologizing and saying, thanks for your work. I'm sorry I was so directive. Like that was her job. And so it can affect it. One of the other things that uh, among these biases, and it may have these perceptions, is we know that women and men, when they're being evaluated, whether it's as residency, fellowship, or um, faculty, will get different, um, they get qualitatively and quantitatively different feedback. And this study um, looked at particularly the biggest difference was in that resident that was struggling. So the ones who need the most help. The men all got very directive things that would move them along. And it was very consistent. Like you need to work on your suturing. You need to work on um, independence. Whereas the women got sometimes diametrically opposed. So they knew something was wrong. Like they knew she was struggling, but they could not or would not tell her what that was. And so that it was unactionable. And I think looking at ways that we can provide feedback, formal and informal, in a way that is actually actionable and consistent, it's something that in healthcare in general um, will help. And again, I think both of our cases, they were individuals who were not getting the kind of feedback that they could become better uh, clinicians or researchers. The study was uh, published last year and um, they, they interviewed men and women residents and talked about the feedback they got and the consistency. And one was the feedback I got from him was to be more confident. And I remember just being like, if any, I were any more confident today, it would have been unsafe. You know, she's being told to, to do that. And then another one, a man commented, a patient told me they didn't trust the medical opinion of their physician who's a global expert in cardiology because she wore high heels and a dress. So none of the men reported any of these. So again, women are walking through their um, healthcare and learning experience in ways that are different from each other. And why this matters, because they don't get the feedback. So that is an impairment to being the best cardiologist and they have less access to mentoring and leadership. So all of these biases, and sometimes we talk about, okay, I'm never going to see anything but the animals that's hardwired in me, right? That's my bias, but I know what that is. And so if we frame this as impaired decision-making in some of these areas in which we all have biases, then we can take action, if nothing else, to know what they are and try to mitigate them. Because some people say, well, it's unconscious, so what am I supposed to do about it? But I think just like other things, we can make ourselves aware. And I think that this um, study was just published within the past few weeks, um, looking at, uh, some of you may know or have taken the Harvard implicit um, tests that uh, reveal our unconscious bias, and it's a huge database. So there's been a question about whether healthcare workers um, have higher bias or the same bias as the population in general. Um, we did, during my term as um, uh, Director of Diversity and Inclusion, we did a climate assessment and we actually asked our staff everything from janitors to physicians to do the implicit association tests. And what we found is that we were about this as a group, we were about the same as the general population because that's all that Harvard Implicit had for us to um, accept in two areas. We were slightly higher um, in racial bias and significantly higher in bias against obesity. And that was a, a head scratcher because the, um, and I, this doesn't address that, but there may be some reasons that healthcare providers have different reasons. And we said, well, maybe because obese patients are harder to care for and nurses put their backs out when they care for them. But regardless, compared to the general population, um, so everyone, they, they looked at racial bias. They looked at black, they looked at Muslim, they looked at Native American and a couple of others. So, um, MDs had higher anti-Black and Arab Muslim implicit and explicit, um, although MDs had lower to Native Americans. Um, but this was largely extinguished by age. And that means by matching the population with the general population, older people and physicians tend to be older, um, have higher biases in these areas than younger people. But it remains significant for the non-physicians. Um, and, uh, and whereas white and Asian male non-physician healthcare workers had the highest bias, racial biases and um, black women had the lowest. So 
I, I show this not because I'm a nerd in implicit biases. It lives in our neighborhood too. And it may not, and it may be, it's certainly the same and it may be more for our allied health professional colleagues. So our two cardiologists, our fellow and our junior faculty experience bias, um, stereotype threats, a whole nother talk. Um, imposter syndrome and microaggressions we'll talk just briefly about. But these are all things that they that we know that women and um, minoritized individuals experience more. So imposter syndrome, we talk about that a lot. We talk about, oh, I felt like I don't belong here. Everybody in the room knows more than I do. And we know that the reality is. Now, the traditional approach to addressing imposter syndrome particularly um, is to fix the person, right? No, let's lift you up, do some positive self-talk, lots of things. And if you look, look at lectures and titles about addressing imposter syndrome, it very much is about how to help that individual feel more confident. But this was a game changer for me. And um, there, it was in the Harvard Business Review and they described how imposter syndrome, you really have to look at what makes somebody feel like an imposter. Well, it's probably not an innate thing. Um, you know, they weren't born feeling inferior. It is the environment that supports that. And in fact, if you look at, if all the messages are, you don't belong here, then that may what be, it is actually a true thing. I am an imposter here because I'm not belong here. So to end the imposter syndrome, fixing the environment and the implications, I think for those of you in leadership is if somebody is talking about, I don't feel like I belong, I'm not good enough. And all the objective evidence is they are, I think that that's where instead of just reassuring them is assessing the culture in which they are working and feeling that way, which is probably uh, a bigger issue. And I, I think the other is believe them. I, I you know, the one comment is, uh, is because it's not my experience does not mean it is not her experience. And, um, and I think a lot of times we try to, I think sometimes reassure, oh, they didn't mean it that way. Whereas believing them and stopping gaslighting can be very helpful. I told you I'd talk uh, briefly about being a first or an only, and there's actually some science around this. So people who are first or only in the, in the role or within a work group um, get more scrutiny. Um, they are more likely to experience bias and microaggressions they are also more likely to be blamed for policies that have nothing to do with them. So for instance, if a, if a cardiology group doesn't have a parental leave policy and they hire their first woman and now they have to deal with it, even though they should have had a parental leave pro policy and they've never activated, that person gets some extra attention about having activated that. And so thinking about how firsts and onlys may feel, they also sometimes do not get the kind of informal curriculum that others do. You know, I think the other thing is when you are first or only or have uh, several um, minoritized identities, you sometimes feel that you have to be okay or do well so that the person who comes behind you, the people that come behind you will be okay that they, you don't wanna screw it up for them. And so this was a quote, not from healthcare. I'm pretty sure that when most white people make a mistake, they don't feel like they're rep representing all Italians or all Irish, but a lot of black Americans do feel that way. So I think that that's an, another burden one might. Um, uh, and this was a, another quote from uh, looking at this type of thing is, energy is often spent navigating systems of oppression while simultaneously seeking to dismantle them for future generations. It means lifting as I climb, ensuring that even though I was the first X to be whatever, I won't be the last. That's a real driving force for a lot of firsts and onlys. So getting back to being a Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. I think you've heard me sort of the evidence is filled is we, we although women and minorities need support, often, what has been done is providing extra leadership training or extra this or this. Those can be really helpful, but if they leave that training with new skills and then go back to the environment, they um, will likely not be able to utilize them. And so looking at ways that we can fix the system, because I think most women and minoritized individuals are doing their part. And I would argue that we have it you know, for our own self-serving needs, we want the best and brightest to continue to come to cardiology and want to be cardiologists. So we don't want to lose them. So I was really fortunate to be involved in the writing group for the um, uh, 
uh, the, the ACC health policy statement on uh, building uh, a, a better cardiology um, sort of culture. And this was one of the figures from that article that, that really what we're aiming for is excellence at the top. But we know that we do have, not commonly, but we do have even at the bottom, some violence within cardiology, even if it's, we're talking about our patients um, uh, being violent to our, our colleagues. So looking how we can move higher on this spiral. So I would encourage you if you're interested in doing some of this work or just learning more that there, there's some things that are, are really toolkits um, uh, within obviously the organizational leadership and actual leadership want, needs to make this happen. This is not something that can be grassroots. Grassroots is helpful um, where people say, yes, I want this to, I want us to change, but this really has to be structured. The only places that have really been able to change culture, whether it's of a profession or of an organization have been ones who've set into place a number of things. And one is leadership and resources. You can't make this come out of thin air. But having a strategic plan, so looking at the bottom uh, at the bottom of this uh, figure, the structure and resources, and that may mean um, a, uh, a a compliance or a diversity person or an educator or all of those that can um, help move things along. You have to have subject matter expertise. I think um, just because somebody is a brown person doesn't know that they know about diversity and inclusion. And I think that's another thing is making sure, you know, bringing in somebody who actually has either the legal or the, um, the, the other experience. It has to be supported by appropriate policies, making sure you have the policies in place. We, when we assessed um, at Mayo, our, we were seeing a rising number of people who were complaining or had um, poor interactions with patients. Patients who were being aggressive, who were being racist, who were being sexist, who were doing lots of things that is really icky. And um, we really didn't have a policy. We had, we had about 50 policies to protect patients and we did not have one to protect us or support us from patients. And so we went through the process of, of doing the education and, and putting in a new policy. And everyone just assumed it. I even called legal in our compliance and I and they said, I said, I've looked at every policy in our organization, the policy book and said, oh yeah, we have one. And they sent me back the policy that was to protect patients for us. I said, no, that has nothing to do with employees. So looking at policies through this lens and making sure the organization has them and then educating people, obviously, for the things that might happen that are adverse is making sure there's some confidential reporting um, and that there is no retaliation for people who come forward with either um, things about themselves or, um, or the organization and really looking at um, trying to improve and drive out bias and discrimination um, and bullying and harassment out of our organizations. And particularly, this is focused on cardiology. And if you read the um, health policy statement, where we could, we put in data from um, cardiology. So I use this um, quote and the images with permission from my excellent colleague, Dr. Meyer Guerrero. For those of you who don't know her, she's about five foot one. Um, she's Mexican, so she speaks with an accent and she's a rock star. She's running a bunch of international clinical trials on structural cardiology um, and TAVR. But she repeatedly at meetings and other things gets comments like this as they are looking down and making those. And it, she's so good natured and she just rolls with it, but it gets tiring because she feels like she has to sort of justify that. So this is one of those which is a microaggression. And what that is, is sort of to put her in her place. Don't know what to say. Here's this um, individual who's clearly at the top of her field, but we don't know what to say to her and we make her feel little. She is already physically small. And it is a, a, a power play that people use sometimes completely unintentionally, but unintentional or not, it has the same effect. And women uh, and people of color are more often to be affected by this. So there's a, a, an alternative, a micro affirmation. So you can actually counter this by actually saying something um, about the individual that affirms their excellence. Um, you know, last year, 
only 1.5% of TAVRs were put in by women cardiologists in the US. Think about that, right? We have some opportunities. 3% were put in by women, but the other 1.5% by women surgeons. And so when you see or witness you're just too pretty and petite to be doing TAVRs, you know, you can come back with a little humor. Wow, I thought I heard you say that women weren't cut out to be interventional cardiologists. I must not have heard you, right? You can use humor. You can seek to understand, but most of us are caught flat-footed. And I would just say that this thing is you need practice. And I'm going to say this in several ways. Maybe you already provide upstander training here, but... Um, it is something that I have found myself until I learned and had some practice things to pull out of my pocket. I would hear this horrible comment at a, you know, I was a witness to it and did not have a quick comeback. So you have to actually, because sometimes you're horrified and, and I would just encourage us all to, you know, learn how to do that. So you can help them think, you can state the facts, you can apologize. And I would encourage you if you realize even a day or two later that you said something cringeworthy, Apologize to the person that you said it to. Um, it makes a huge difference because you can't be an ally or an advocate in silence. So an upstander, that is somebody who actively defends a cause or belief or intervenes when someone is being bullied, mistreated, or is the target of a microaggressor. And it's distinct from a bystander. A bystander witnesses it, may report it, but they don't act on it. And being an upstander um, is harder and, and you really have to, to, to learn to do that. You know, another fact is 80% of white people consider themselves allies to people of color, but less than 40% of those same individuals have ever spoken up. So presumably they want to, they are not lying when they say that they are um, allies and advocates and they need something, skills, um, motivation, something to be more active. And I think being an ally sponsor is something that's just really important for um, the more senior people, for men, for those of us who are in the majority. So I would say, even if there are medical students and residents, um, it's not just leaders. Any of us can be um, upstanders. And teaching that skill and giving some things is one of the most effective ways of changing a culture because people start, if everyone's talking about it and they call people out on it, not in a bad way, not in an aggressive way, people start realizing, oh, I just said something, but they also realize this is not a culture that tolerates that. But I do think leaders are really important. When we interviewed um, uh, residents and uh, nursing staff about why they didn't report and I had one, um, uh, why they didn't report things that patients did or said to them. Um, and I had an interview with a woman who was referred to me and she had had just kind of horrible, horrible um, experience with a patient. And I, I was pleased that her colleagues and her faculty member all did the exact right thing, um, but it still was uh, extremely uh, upsetting to her. Um, but nobody really uh, took that, step and she blamed herself. Cause I said, why didn't you let your faculty come in? He offered to come in at two o'clock in the morning to support you. I told him not to. And I said, why that's his job. Um, and she said, cause I thought I should be able to handle it myself. And this was a pretty egregious thing. It was a patient's family member um, who was a physician. And so it was, um, so they may not tell you because they feel like it's a, it reflects on a weakness. So being really open about it and uh, encouraging them. Now you may say, where's the data on inclusion and why I might wanna be a more inclusive person? Well, this is not in healthcare, but this is in raters of leaders and there were over 1.5 million 360s. Those individuals who scored in the top um, 10th percentile on these two questions, takes initiative to support and include patient, different people and actively builds a trust, uh, a climate of trust, appreciation and openness. We're in the top 10th percentile of leadership. And those who scored the lowest on this had the lowest overall leadership scores. So they are definitely correlated. And I think that that's another thing is pushing when we are evaluating our leaders in healthcare and in cardiology is this being an important metric. So, I would just encourage all of us to use our power and influence and advocate for in individual and structural change. That's the call to action really today. And so some of the things that are kind of practical. So this was um, 
uh, it's a couple of years old now, but uh, Nazreen Ibrahim, um, heart failure doc. So here is this heart failure CME course, and it had pictures, so it was even more obvious, but not one female faculty in the whole thing. And there's a lot of faculty. This isn't a little, you know, five of them. So she calls it out. And we obviously know that there are a number of uh, probably qualified heart failure docs. Um, the ally part of this, Clyde Yancey, black man on the program and several others who said, gosh, I'm not okay with this. In fact, I don't wanna to speak at this conference under these conditions. I'm gonna make sure that we have more women faculty on board. And it was, it, it ended up being about a 20% women faculty when the course actually went live. And I think thinking about the messages that we send if we are on a panel, uh, all white, um, or a mantle, all men, and being cognizant enough and putting it in our kind of plant. Well, so who else is going to be on that panel? Oh, gosh. If I think that there's probably somebody more qualified than I am. Um, I have this Hispanic colleague who might be able to, or the men saying, gosh, I'm not comfortable being on a panel with all men because I think that there probably are some women that could represent us. Those are very powerful ally behaviors. They also mean stepping aside to perhaps what might be kind of a juicy opportunity. And I think that's that's one of the challenges. Um, I, I'll speak briefly. We know that um, women cardiologists make less than men straight out of the gate, straight out of training and controlling for a hundred things, it's still lower. Um, uh, and they also are more likely to perform uncompensated work. And we often call this office house work, which could be leading an unprestigious committee, but really important, doing the diversity inclusion work, planning the office Christmas party, all of those things tend to fall more on uh, women and minorities. And um, they may take away from paid work, but they also may take away from time to do research or other things that are promotable. And I, I think that's the other cultural thing that we can do is certainly after the reckoning um, with George Floyd and COVID and the recognition of the, the huge disparities. There were an awful lot of organizations, I'm sure Emory Mayo did, who, who declared this is so important. This is such a high priority for their or our organization. Um, but what we see is that it's a high priority, but often the people doing the work are not given the resources necessarily to do it. So it, it, the, the, the money is not where the mouth is. And so um, in these, where they looked at um, among women were more likely to be doing um, as managers, the informal diversity and inclusion work and more time compared to men. And when it's being recognized often that diversity and inclusion, I, I'll give you an example. So a woman, leader who leads successfully through a terrible crisis in the organization um, by um, is often said, well, she was just really good taking care of her people because she's empathetic. And that was really what was needed rather than that was the skill that was needed. It's put on her female characteristics. The black woman who leads a diversity and inclusion panel and does it exquisitely well, that's just her passion. No, it's a skill set. And I think often we sort of fall to thinking, well, that's just natural inbred and uh, innate. And so of course they did a good job. That's why often, um, and, and so I think thinking through how we will equitably, if we say it's important, um, then, uh, then recognizing it. So the other thing, and I don't know anything about your compensation plan, but um, I think it's important to assess it and make sure that there they are no sex or, um, or race ethnicity disparities that are not accounted for by the plan. And actually having a compensation plan is the first step to doing that. Um, we're not gonna talk about flexibility in detail. I would just say, as I started, this isn't all about reproductive age women. Um, one of the things that is addressed in this policy statement is as senior um, cardiologists who are disproportionately male um, say, I don't want to take STEMI call anymore. There are some practices that if you can't do it all, you are out. And so that is very short-sighted when we talk about um, the need for cardiologists. We would like to keep them maybe not doing STEMI call. Um, but being compensated in different ways and being valued um, uh, later in their career and talking about how 
you know, practices can value call and make sure that they know you're not going to make the same money when you stop taking STEMI call, but we still want you seeing patients and teaching our fellows. So I think looking at flexibility writ large, not just I need to be home at three o'clock when the bus gets home for my kids. So kind of just bring it all together. Leaders need to be Jedis. We all should, but it's particularly important for those of the who are visible leaders. We need to acknowledge that these problems, data helps, and data helps at your own organization. I got the farthest at Mayo. The Mayo thought, yeah, that's a problem. We see those reports. That's probably not as big a problem at Mayo because we're Mayo, right? And uh, you know, until you can get at it and get the data from your own organization, it was game changing honestly, when we got a climate assessment of our own staff. And I had senior leaders, uh, quote, I've been living in a bubble. And another one who said, not in my house. Like this was a surprise to him, but it, 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 it is motivating. Um, to the extent you can, looking at external structures um, uh, that may be adversely impacting your group, certain people in the group and looking to change those. And that may be the climate, it might be perceptions, it may be motherhood bias, um, lack of flexibility. And if you had a little bit more, everyone would gain. Addressing unconscious bias. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about biology and career trajectory, but obviously um, people with uteruses are the only ones who are going to keep the, um, you know, keep humankind going. And some of them are cardiologists. And it often happens, reproduction happens when we are expecting them to be more academic, the most academically um, productive. And so looking at ways that we that are different than the way academic medicine has. It's not the first seven years and out, you know, up and out or whatever. It's well, their the career trajectory may be a real uptick later in their career. Let's give them a chance because um, we want to keep them and we want them to not just be checking time. Um, a policy and procedure for a patient and visitor misconduct, um, transparent processes for addressing discrimination and harassment, and training and practice for allies and upstanders. So a nice segue on um, Dr. Guerrero is she posted this on Twitter on this year's um, National Women's Day. So our first tower this morning, the only male team member was a fellow who said, wow, should I leave? And I told him those are important words that reflect how I felt a couple of decades ago when I was a first ever female fellow in my cardiology fellowship. Feels great to see that today is different and no, you should not leave. We all belong here. Oops. So getting back to Dr. Jones and Hernandez, um, the culture and climate of cardiology is changing. I think challenges remain and we, um, and we can continue to gain momentum of that. And just to remind us that this is not a zero sum game because equity for others doesn't mean less equity for me. Um, it's not pie. So I will be happy to take questions in the short time that we have. I realize some people need to get to clinical work. Are there questions from the audience? Dr. Hayes, Dr. Sherman, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, just a little bit more about your policies and procedures with patients, you know, who are um, <clears throat> abusive or, you know, or just tend to be, uh, <clears throat> tend to be uh, crazy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we have uh, in Georgia, some of them might be carrying a gun. But I was just wondering, as an institution, uh, how are these things handled, and what are what are the faculty expected to do? Uh, it can, you know, it can be uh, it can be tough. Yeah. So um, we actually developed a formal reporting uh, um, mechanism, which we did not have, and in fact, we we so didn't have one that people were actually going to the patient experience office, that's where the patients report us, but they, it was such an egregious thing and that obviously the staff were not equipped to do that. So one is to have a reporting um, uh, structure so you can gather things and, and have somebody gather facts. The other is to have a policy with, with procedure steps. So it gives some guidance. And how we did it is we left the discretion to the treating team which is really important because one of the things we said you can't do is you can't just pick a type of provider because I only want a white man with gray hair, right? You can't say that, or I don't want a black person caring for me. And because that was part of it, that may not be mistreatment, but it is um, bias or discrimination. 
And so the answer, the default answer is, is going to be no. And if they come back with um, a, a compelling reason, like, and we left an out for, um, it would be adverse for their patient care. So somebody who comes into the ED and they're brandishing perhaps a weapon, um, which hopefully somebody will take away from them, um, or they're saying racial epithets and don't want to be cared for by the Black ER resident, um, then we're probably going to uh, make sure that if there is somebody else, we're going to give them a white person um, so we can facilitate their care, but we'll address it later. Similarly, for somebody who is delirious, sometimes it's better for patient care to, to give in or qualify. But we, um, we have a, a pretty robust policy and procedure that is supported by leadership. And that was another problem we had is somebody would report it and then somebody would say, oh, but he's a nice guy or we're not gonna fire that patient. And so people stopped reporting it. It felt icky to be reported. So that's the other thing is having um, the buck stops here. And uh, that if I say this patient treated me or my fellow in such a way that if we don't have, if we can't get through and a conversation with him or setting some guidelines around it, then he can't be a patient here anymore, obviously, except for emergencies. So it's it's more complex than I can describe. And it required a lot of training because it required training on what to report. It required training. We actually have an, af um, an uh, acronym, SAFER training. It's um, how to de-escalate things. So we've trained our frontline people um, how to do that. So it's it, it really isn't just a policy. A policy won't stick. It's a change of the needs of the patient come first always. We're always going to do whatever they need to the needs of the patient come first, but not their wants. And our most valuable resources are people. He, I think he had yeah, Thank you. Um, just comments about how do we attract diversity into cardiology, maybe at an earlier stage. I think about my wife who uh, is a physician and her high school counselor did not recommend that she consider medicine. medicine. Um, she, my wife's actually counseled a number of relatives, other people about becoming physicians rather than becoming nurses or becoming nurse practitioners. How, how do we get in earlier to say, look, cardiology is a field um, that you can be yeah. successful in? I think that, we, that's we, a question. And then another thing is, I, as, as I look at in, institutionally, and I'm, I'm on a group looking at wellness, mm -hmm. um, and we can talk about wellness, we can talk about flexibility, but medicine has become so business oriented, so budget oriented. So, you know, one of the things we're facing now and that we had to sort of speak up against was this concept of that a clinic, a half day of clinic or whatever is 240 minutes that you got to be booked solidly through. How do we deal with that, all the needs of uh, all, all, the, all the needs that of one may have outside the workplace, creating flexibility. My wife was able to do that in a private practice setting that she controlled, but how do you do that in a big institution? Yeah, those are two great questions. So we, we had a few years ago, it was a grave misstep by the then CEO was eliminate white space. White space was every minute on your calendar that was not fully booked. And this, this was before all the conversation about wellness. This was about a decade ago. It was so demoralizing. It was so impossible, right? Um, that it, it 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 there was a huge rollback, step back, and gave up autonomy back. So if that's the case, I imagine history may repeat itself here because it's not feasible. And I think we who see that it, it doesn't advance patient care. You're right, budgets big. It's it, and and when we have a crisis or when we're in the red or we're below projections, that's when ill-advised types of things. And I think what we need to step up is have effective voices, which may not be heard always, but we need to be consistent about the wellness of our people and our patients. And I don't think that that's sustainable. And I think another argument to your own organization is, okay, not everybody else is using that particular solution. And in fact, we're going to lose our good people because they're either going to retire early or they're going to leave and go to another organization. Not everybody loves Mayo so much that they will stay here or Emory so much. So I, I do think that that is a tension that we need um, to constantly be looking at 
um, uh, on, and, and I think the argument for patient outcomes and patient um, satisfaction and all of that, because that went down to during that white space thing, not only were we incredibly stressed um, because you didn't have time to go to the bathroom um, and much less do your charting, but you also, the patients weren't that happy either. Um, getting to the not encouraging women or people of color to go into medicine at all. I mean, there, there is actually a word for it. It's called benevolent sexism. Um, and that's when a well-meaning person says, you know, a woman says, I want to be an interventional cardiologist. And somebody says, are you sure? Like, that's really hard. It's really long. Think about the STEMI call thing. You know, no, I just said that's like, instead of saying, wow, that's a cool thing to do. Um, we inadvertently sometimes the counselor, um, we have assumptions about it. We also, in society, we feel like women may need to be taken care of. And so sometimes there is this reticence. And I cannot tell you how many internal medicine residents are told women are told not to go into cardiology. Um, and, and, I, and I think that if you ask what we can do, I think we can get out there. I sing loud. I said, I have never looked back. I am so glad despite the challenges, this is the best thing I can do. Cardiology is the coolest. And I think that, and you know, and I know it wasn't easy. I was married to a cardiologist, but I have two kids. They turned out all right. You can do it. And I think those are the messages that they need to hear. And they need to hear more often with the acknowledgement that yes, we have a profession and a specialty that requires more work than average, right? And has less flexibility perhaps than average, but it doesn't have the zero flexibility that many of us have been led to believe. I, it's interesting this weekend, I had a really interesting conversation with three program directors from other specialties. And I, I don't work in, um, in this area, but I was really shocked to find out that for them, the complaints they received about residents were like the three to one ratio women to men. And, and the, the theme obviously is how bad of a system we're in if, if our female trainees are being subjected to this kind of, I mean, quite frankly, abuse, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if, and, and it was interesting that they were coming from all different directions, as you can imagine, from nursing staff, from other physicians, um, and, and obviously largely unjustified. Do you have suggestions for how to sort of at a systemic level, how to address that issue? I think having formal, um, having a formal reporting um, and, and a consistent action plan, because this is grossly underreported. It is grossly underreported. And it's, uh, and if you ask people why they didn't, and there have been studies that have asked, okay, 70% of you witnessed this and only 10% of you reported it is they had watched it not be addressed so many times, they'd learned what was the point. It was sort of a futile, um, uh, futile, or that they would somehow be blamed. So I think systemically having structures in place that allow it, and then some actions that show, we're actually gonna investigate this, or you know, not in my, now that I have the data, now that I know this happens, not in my house, um, and, and having some consequences. And it, it can start small, it can start in a, it, it, by having, you know, one way to start, if you just really want to do it within cardiology, is talking to the group, talking to the residents or the the female fellows or the um, the all of them, because if you get that none of the men are experiencing this and three quarters of the women are, then it's probably not that women are just over reporters. So, so I, I guess maybe I wasn't. So it's going the other direction actually. Oh. So the so the the women residents and fellows were being reported by other oh. folks within the system more often because they're on, it's a notion of sort of total, whether I wouldn't call it a double standard, I would just say it's sort of outright sexism with regard to yeah. perceptions of different kinds of actions. Yeah, like so, really so I'm sorry, I didn't misunderstand you. So uh, that, uh, that also happens. And I think some of it is the fact that if they're, they may be more visible, particularly if they are minorities in the program. I think that again, the, 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 the the range of behavior that we uh, allow women is often much narrower. And so they get reported and called out. So some of it is making the process more objective um, because some of those may be legit. I'm not saying that women are always gonna do the right thing. They need to be reported, but are, are we seeing any reports for men for the same behavior? Well, maybe we have a reporting bias problem. And so sometimes that data can be really helpful. I mean, 
it's at, it's got you asking those questions because of just the observations. Um, I, what we saw, particularly when our patients would report, um, our old process, again, this is not what we do now for the patient reported, but a patient would complain about a physician. They can complain about me. If they have a complaint about me, they, they go to patient experience, a near verbatim report is then sent to me and my chair, right? So if the reason that they didn't like seeing me was because I was a woman and that was the whole purpose of it, and I have been injured during the patient's visit because of their behavior toward me, and then I get doubled down because now they've gone and reported it and it's sent to my chair. Now we don't do that anymore. There's a little more nuance <laughs> there. Um, but but you you could see how that would be even more harmful if the whole reason I don't want to see you is because of your identity, um, not because of your medical care. Um, and, and those are things that are experienced. And the younger you are, um, the less white you are, and the more female you are, the more likely that is going to happen. Dr. King. Mayo and, and Emory are uh, private institutions and and. and we're big into diversity and inclusion, right? right. Uh, so I'm struck with the recent news where uh, public institutions are coming under, under fire for embracing diversity and inclusion. And diversity and inclusion has now become an evil yeah. thing as uh, manifest by the uh, uh, what the University of Virginia is going through right now where they, they've appointed uh, somebody who's totally opposed to it to the board uh, and says that that, that, that uh, we should forget all this that this is risking excellence uh, that uh, you know we're, we're, we're about excellence we're not about yeah. diversity or inclusion any of that kind of uh, silly woke stuff so what's the response to how do you deal with this it is very troubling times I think for um, individuals who are doing this as their work right um, I, I, although it's not my formal role at Mayo anymore. And despite the fact that we are private institutions, we are publicly funded in many ways. We get federal grants, we get, and so we come under the exact same rules and will. And so there's a lot of talk of how are we going to respond if they roll back affirmative action for medical school admission, right? They're doing it for Harvard undergraduate, but it's going to apply to other things. Um, we, and I, I think that we need to continue to talk about it in ways that not will change those folks who, um, who, who think it's all about equality. You know, I could give a whole talk on equity. You know, we have to treat some people differently for them to have the same outcomes. And that I think is better, in my personal opinion, is better for society, is making sure that it's the same with patients. If we treat men and women with heart disease exactly the same for every condition, they will not have equal outcomes because we'll overdose some women. There are certain um, drugs that may cause side effects. There's lots of good healthcare analogies to that. I just think that we need to continue to talk about our values. You can read, to, you know, a Mayo or an Emory or a, an Emory cardiology can talk about our values as for our patient care. There is evidence that shows. I shared a little bit of it, that maybe if we had a more diverse staff, our patient care outcomes, doesn't Emory, doesn't the world care about outcomes for diverse patients, which costs the, you know, I, I've, I've perfected many of these arguments and it depends on my audience on whether I talk about the business case or the right, you know, or, or the, the, the emotional case. I think there are many, many arguments. Um, it has, it is unfortunate that this has been so politicized because some of the things that, you know, even the word woke has been misappropriated, right? It doesn't mean what it was meant. It was a word created by African-Americans to talk about white allies, uh, you know, and now it's used as a weapon. And, um, and so I don't have a solution other than the people who feel strongly about promoting it need to speak up because the people who are speaking up and trying to, um, to, to roll back um, equity, in my opinion, um, are speaking very loudly. And, and I think we shouldn't be cowed by that. All right, thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.